Hi guys, welcome to Plant the Lights Nursery at the Juniper Level Botanical Garden. My name is Megan Fiddler. Today I'd like to talk to you about bees as pollinators. Um, now everybody knows a lot about, oh, bees pollinate stuff. Well, we're going to think a little bit more about bees as a social critter that they are. Um, bees actually live in big colonies. They communicate through vibrations and they actually travel to different spaces based upon those so that everybody can go to the right plant. That's because most of the pollinators that are going to gather um, pollen for honey actually go to a single plant at one time, which is great. I've run apiaries before and that's what it calls when you have lots of beehives around and you can always find when a bee is found a popsicle because you can look down the honeycomb and all of a sudden it's oh beautiful honey and it's purple but now it's not purple anymore so they actually go to one single source and they make sure that that single source is going to be that column for the honeycomb itself so understanding them as social animals as well as pollinators really helps us understand what's going to go on I'm going to take you over here now and I'm going to show you a couple of salvias um, and I'm going to show you a native bush that I think is still going to have some of the native pollen pollinators. We may not be able to find all the bees that I want to show you, um, but I'm going to ask you some philosophical questions about what it means to have imported pollinators. Most of our pollinators are not native. Okay, the little native bees don't actually produce the same amount of honey as what our hives here on the property do, which is run by the Italian three-ring bee. So we've taken all these bees from many places in the world and brought them over here, sometimes with bad effects because they can get a little aggressive because we want more of the honey product than we do of the pollination. Now that means we're maybe out competing our native bees and our native bees were native for a purpose because they're used to the flowers and the flowers that are here actually developed and had their evolutionary traits work with them so that they could pick a certain pollinator. For example, the squash bee. There's a squash bee and it's a little tiny bee, it tends to be native. We're not going to find any today because they're really early risers. They wake up very early in the morning and they're gone as soon as the heat has come. And it's kind of hot right now, so we're not going to find them. However, some of the other native or non-native bees, like the Italian three ring, actually don't do the same job that this little squash bee does. It doesn't go up into the flower. It actually drills a hole at the top of the flower, which means it misses all of the flower's reproductive organs, but it still gets the pollen and the little sweet nectar that it produces. So it's interesting to think about if we're bringing these bees in because we want honey and we think we're making pollinators, are we actually jeopardizing na native plants and are we jeopardizing some of of our crops because each of these bees pollinates differently. When you walk towards these bushes, they are covered. They are bees. They do sting, some of them, um, unless you're going to find a carpenter bee. They're often marked with a white dot on their forehead and considered pests because they drill into your woodwork. They're a main pollinator for many of our food crops. If they have a white dot on their forehead, they are the most inquisitive ones. They're also male which means they don't have a stinger. So when you start seeing those bees and they fly right here and look you right in the eyes, don't be scared. <laughs> the females are typically all black on that species um, and they do have stingers. However, they are also very docile. They're just very inquisitive little bees. So there's a lot of different ways to think about these guys. Sometimes we categorize them as pests, which is odd because we need them for our food production. And sometimes we categorize them as great because they make food, i.e. the honey. But sometimes when we categorize them as great, we're actually losing out on some of the other populations, like the native little bees, uh, because they're just being outcompeted. When we walk towards these bushes, after I've been running an apiary for a while, the trick to working with these animals or these bugs is to stay calm. Okay? If you freak out, they freak out. So don't freak out. If you feel like you're freaking out, back off a little bit. Okay? Because I can't really show you what these bees look like and identify them if you're not right there close with them. And if you feel nervous or scared, just take a couple steps back and I'll be able to talk you through later. Um, or you can come to a different class where I actually have PowerPoints where they are on the screen and they are not going to ever get near you. So if you're nervous, that's fine. Come on, let's take some look at some salvias. Yeah. Okay, 
You guys stay back here, because I if you break one of my taxonomist tags, he will be very angry. It takes a lot of time. So we're going to start with this salvia right here. And let's look at the activity and look at actually what's going on with how the bees are feeding. Right now here, this little one right here, that's an Italian three ring bee. That's from our local hives, okay? And you can always tell because they're not so fuzzy and you can actually count. It's got three rings on its abdomen, all right? And now we've got the, no, the big old bumblebees that are just bumbling around in here. And that is actually a carpenter bee, so. Here's a bumblebee over here. Yeah. One over there. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so those are bumblebees. But look at the way, different ways that they're feeding. All of the bees are actually great pollinators because they spend their entire life gathering pollen. It's how they make their honey, it's how they make their food sources for the next generation, okay? So what they do is they come through here and their hairs on their body actually have electrostat or electrostaticity, okay? And so when they're coming through here, they're gathering the pollen and some of them stick it on their thighs and that's when you see those big packets that they're carrying around. And it's cute when they do that because sometimes they get so heavy that they're kind of top heavy when they fly. Um, but for the most part, that's what flowers are relying on. They're relying on those hairs and that touch and the feel. Now most flowers do have a preferred kind of pollinator and sometimes a preferred kind of bee. Now if we're watching here with the bumblebee, all of the flower's sexual organs, sorry Salvia, are up here at the top. So we've got the stamen and the pistil here. So we've got a very narrow opening for this flower to actually be pollinated be pollinated. I did it. <laughs> okay. But now if we're watching the actual bumblebee here, they are skipping that entire process. Do you see him? Yeah. Do you see what he's doing? What's he doing? Uh-uh. He's drilling a hole in there. So they're coming up here and they're actually getting into this part of the actual flower. Now that's okay because this salvia really isn't native to the coastal North Carolina area. Uh, we brought it here so they're welcome to drink that sweet nectar all they want um, because it probably wouldn't be pollinated here anyway. We're going to look at a native flower in a little bit that does need the native pollinators but that's interesting to always watch. You want to see what kind of actual sexual organs are in the flower and able to be, in order to be able to associate it with its corresponding pollinator. Let's go right down here for one more salvia before we hit the native flower. I blackened the new salvia because it's all day long. They just never leave. That, but that's a bigger salvia. Yeah. It's nice and big and open. Now that can be pollinated yeah. by those well, guys. Like, those guys are there all day long. They just never leave. They just, it's like... Oh. It is. It's a big bumble, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now a lot of people only want to think as bees as the primary pollinators. You've also got birds, like of course the hummingbird. We're going to stop right here. You've got um, bumblebees. You have sweat bees. Now sweat bees are often categorized as flies. Sweat bees are really bright and colorful. They're often like a neon green. And you get scared of them because they lick salt. They do salt as well as the small honeys. Um, and when you slap them, then they sting you. So there's a whole bunch of different kind of bees that are in this region. And like I said, including the squash bee and the carpenter bee. Now if we look here, we've got the, oh, let's see if I, yeah. Nope, that's an Italian three ring. Hold on a second, I gotta, they, these guys are not really paid visitors, so oh. it's, it's whoever is here that I get yeah, to I show you. I wish I could. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart, you're such a sweetie. All right, well I had some earlier. There is the other, one of the other bees that gets imported here besides the Italian three ring is a German honeybee. And you can tell the German honeybee, which I had some on here this morning, because unlike the three ring, they actually have this big fuzzy mane. So the, the Italian hummingbees kind of got a bald spot right here, and the Germans got just a big fuzzy lion mane all the way around the top. And they look different and they feed different as well. But I'm not seeing any. You guys want to come here and show me what you're seeing? Like I said, if you're if you're calm, they're fine. I can. I saw a little, it's yeah. Probably a three ring over there. You got a three ring? Yeah, it looks like it's down over there. Um, on that far. Yeah, it's yeah, on the, the far. There he is. He's it's coming towards. Ball. There he is. Yep. Three ring. One, two, three. That's it. Hi, sweetheart. Yeah. So those are all from our hives here. Um, no. It's got five, and it's not fuzzy enough. I don't know. 
Okay. Yeah. How many mines do you have here? I've got three. Mm -hmm. The three, they are located for guest and visitor safety um, down the hill near where the compost pile is. You made me jump. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we have everything on the property. We have EpiPens in case anything does really happen. Um, but yeah, so. Here Yep. That's it. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the sweepies, yeah, the sweepies also come and pollinate flowers as well. Um, like I said, their category is a lot as flies, and they will come out here and visit. But like I said, everything has a different time of day. So for some of these, I'm not going to be able to show you because they come out very early in the morning. What is that? You were looking at it, but what is it? What thing? That's a bumble. Is it a dead bumble? It has not moved. She's not dead, but she's just going to hang out there for a little okay. bit. So, right. taking a break. Um, let's go and, and see the native plant, because I think we might be able to find some native bees there. Oh! So a lot of people think all the time that bees are the biggest pollinators. Oh, she left. I'll show you on the other one. But actually, there's a whole lot of winged insects that sting that do pollinate, including many wasps. So if you're seeing wasps and you're taking wasps out of your garden, you're also limiting some of the pollinator ability, depending on which species that you're taking out. Who's on this? Not many people right now. Yeah, okay. Now this is a fantastic spot to stop and explore because we're going to have, it looks like I got at least four different kinds of pollinators on this right now. We've got the big old bumbles which are showing and now I've got a ground bee right here. Whoop, sorry sweetheart, didn't mean to scare you. And if you come closer, we do have none of them. It's just too hot out right now for the little native bees. <laughs> So, while we stand here, I'm going to see who visits, um, but realize that about $160 million of U.S. agriculture, of the food that you eat, is due to actual bee pollination, whether it be what species that you choose. In fact, one in three bites of your food is actually generated by these guys here. When you're working in your gardens and you see a bug or a critter that you don't want on your plant, and you use something called a systemic, a systemic is a pesticide that is drawn up from the roots and then comes up through the entire plant. Now that's fine on many plants, okay? So if you're using that, for example, on a mangabe that is flowering maybe once in every three years, you're good to go because it's not flowering. But when we're talking about pollinators, using a systemic on a pollinator means that that pesticide comes up from the roots and actually gets into the flower. And that's how these bees transfer it back to the colony. Okay, so it can be quite a big problem. Um, and not having quite as many visitors as I want, there was wasps up here earlier. <laughs> With the lion mane? Yeah. Ah, okay, well let's switch sides and get away from the fan. Now this is stunning. If you were using that something like a hibiscus, would that be a problem? When do hibiscus bloom? Well, it's when my mom was just about finished, but they've been blooming almost all summer. How long is a systemic's half-life? I don't know. Huh? Then you better find out. How long is it generally? Depends on which one you're choosing. I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to use it. That's the thing. That's the thing. 
I'm about to turn it on. Oh, that, that's a native right there, that little one. What was that? That was a native. Oh. Yeah, the little tiny ones. I have three epi pins in my bag. Oh, good for you. It's, it's, I've got them on property as well. Let's see here. Yeah, it's not so windy. Yeah, so here's here's one. See the big fuzzy lion mane? That's one of the German pollinators. That's, it's got oh. five rings on it. Uh huh. Mm hmm So that's not from our hives. It's from somewhere else. I don't know if they've made a colony around here or if somebody else is keeping hives. That is a possibility. We have a lot of farms in the region. Um, but being able to recognize what each of these little bees are doing and how where they live and what time they wake up is going to give you a better clue about how they're going to be able to pollinate. So. I encourage you all, when you see bees or when you see things, especially the carpenter bees, because they're vilified, but I kind of like them, they do a really good job at pollinating, um, look at it here. The other thing that we're not seeing that I was seeing about an hour ago is all the wasps, and I wanted to introduce you to some of those species as well, but time of day, they're not out right now. So. Thank you all. This, like I said, it was a brief introduction. If you would like to learn more about entomology or if you would like to study more insects with me, uh, just let me know. And we're going to be holding more in-depth classes as we move around or go through the year, actually, in the seasons. So keep an eye out for those. And yeah, let's go play in the garden. I, I have a question yes. about bees, mm -hmm. um, honeybees. I, uh, I grow in the spring, I grow poppies. Yep. Like these big, tall purple poppies. Okay. And the honeybees love them, but it almost looks like they start rolling around in the in the flower, like in the pollen. It's their hairs. Okay. It feels good. Okay. Also, I I think if I remember reading correctly that. Um, they might actually have a little fun <laughs> in there, mm -hmm. just a little. But that you know, it's it's pretty hard to like figure out a bee's psychology. You know, they can't ask them questions. They don't fill out questionnaires well. You know, they just they just don't. Um, but I think that they probably do have some fun. I do remember reading an article that had suggested such. So. Okay. And Thank you do you have so a much. class next Saturday about hummingbirds? I have a next class next Saturday about hummingbirds. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people signed up already. Uh, we don't have a lot of spaces left. It's a two-hour class, um, and it is talking about uh, the species that come and visit or transit through, the species that we typically get and their migration schedules, and the ways that you can actually organize your garden in order to keep them in a colony established so you can see them fight and squabble. You should see them fight and squabble. They're very territorial. They talk a whole lot when they get extra boys and girls on those flowers and they yell at each other. But we can talk about all that and setting that up and if you're interested, please let me know.